The first speaker is, uh, is Professor Gek Kelman. Yep. Yes. Uh, he's going to present uh, Ohm's law and the collision of magnetic flux ropes. Please. OK, thank you. Uh, this is an uh, experimental paper. And so uh, everything that you're going to see is data, experimental data. It's not a simulation. Uh, these are my colleagues. I won't read all the names uh, that worked on this with me. And uh, first, I might uh, mention what's a magnetic flux rope. Uh, many may know, but essentially magnetic flux ropes are bundles of helical uh, twisted magnetic fields. And in the center of the rope, you have this blue line. The field's nearly straight becomes more twisted as you go out. And then, of course, that magnetic field has to be accompanied by a current, right? And so uh, with the current, when the current ends, then the field goes away. There are flux, many, many instances of flux ropes in nature. I, I'm not even going to begin to tell you what they all are. Uh, but <clears throat> people are fairly certain that these things which are uh, coronal ropes, twisted um, coronal loops, are magnetic flux ropes. They have currents. They're huge. The sun is absolutely covered with them. Uh, and there's a photo of the sun in UV light. And uh, there's a picture, a little dot that would be the size of the Earth compared to this, uh, these flux ropes. So what I'm going to talk about is the ropes themselves, because uh, they're currents and they're in a background field. There are forces on these currents, so they twist, they writhe, and they can be kink unstable. And in fact, in this experiment, the ropes are kink unstable. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, we're talking about two magnetic ropes. And uh, in this experiment, we can force them to collide periodically. When they do, some magnetic energy is destroyed in a process uh, called reconnection. I'll mention uh, something called the quasi-separatrix layer briefly, which essentially tells you where the reconnection is happening. Uh, the main thrust of this is we've measured uh, every single term in Ohm's law to calculate the plasma resistivity. And what we found is that uh, you can't use Ohm's law. It's non-local. Then we used. Um, something called the Kubo resistivity, which comes from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And that actually allowed us to uh, arrive at what the resistivity of the plasma is in space. And, uh, and then I'm also going to talk about, I threw this in at the end, based on some of the talks I listened to, the ropes are chaotic. So I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> something called um, the entropy and complexity of these ropes. So this is a large plasma device. You've seen a couple pictures of it before. Uh, the one things I'll point out that maybe haven't been mentioned is it has 450 access ports, many of them with valves. So there's an enormous amount of locations where you can put probes and spectrometers and so on on the machine. Uh, <clears throat> it's also a user facility. It's funded by uh, the Department of Energy, mostly, and, and National Science Foundation. And half of the time on the machine is given away to users. And anybody can become a user, including everybody in the room here. Uh, all you have to do is come up with a great idea. And we'll do the experiment. If you're a theoretician, that's OK. As long as you're actively involved with the experiment, we'll work with you and do it. Use of the machine is free. So how does a machine work? Well, there are two plasma sources. On the left there, uh, and then there's a, photo, a picture of it down here, is a barium oxide cathode. It's 60 centimeters across, and it makes a plasma 60 centimeters in diameter. Um, the, there are magnets, 100 of them, that go the length of the machine. And what I did was foreshorten uh, this. This is, looks like there's only a few of those purple magnets. There's actually like 66 of them. Uh, <clears throat> to show you just the geometry. On the, uh, so on, on one end, you have uh, this anode and cathode. 
Now, how do we make the flux ropes? You need uh, very strong currents that have their own uh, azimuthal field. So on the, on the uh, left over here, shown schematically, we have a cathode 20 centimeters across made of a material called lanthanum hexavoride, which has an enormous emissivity. And so we can get uh, very large current densities out of it. We then put a mask in front of it with two holes, one for each flux rope. And then 11 meters away, uh, we have an anode. So the background plasma has no current flowing through it. The cathode and anode are very close to each other. So it's very quiescent background plasma. But then we make currents of these two ropes done with the transistor switch. And this is all experiment that I'm going to show you. So we have a whole variety of probes. Um, these B dot probes are actually three axis differentially wound magnetic field probes. The whole thing's just a few uh, millimeters in size. And uh, they move by stepping motors on probe drives. So we actually measure the magnetic field, the flow with a mock probe, the plasma potential with an emissive probe, uh, at about 50,000 locations in the machine versus time. Okay, so data set, we were running the machine pulses once a second, 24 hours a day. This took about six weeks uh, to do. And so how did the experiment work? We turn on the background plasma. Um, that's the current versus time from that barium oxide cathode once a second. And then uh, sometime after the plasma settled down, it's in steady state, we switch the rope currents on for a few milliseconds. So during that purple line over there. These are just some of the parameters uh, of the plasma. So Lundquist number S can be as high as 10 to the sixth. And uh, for this experiment, the background field was, was 330 gauss. You can go to two kilogauss in the machine, but it doesn't work well for flux ropes. So how do we take data? This is the one component of magnetic field versus time. Now the flux ropes, I'll show you in another slide, are kink unstable. So, they, and so they're going to start kinking, and that's when they smash into each other to give you reconnection. But the time that the kink starts uh, varies by 100 microseconds or so every shot. You can't control when it starts. At least we didn't for these two ropes. So instead, uh, so if you just took 10 or 15 shots and averaged them, uh, they'd average to a very small number, which wouldn't be the field. So we used something called a conditional trigger for all of this, essentially correlated. We took one magnetic probe, which was sitting uh, at the edge of one of the flux ropes throughout the entire experiment for, for six weeks, and it recorded the magnetic field versus time. When the thing starts kinking, you get the sinusoidal uh, signal in the magnetic field. So we use t equals zero, not at the time when we turn on the ropes, but at the time when the ropes start moving. When you do that, you can do a beautiful average. So this is the average over the same number of shots. So this is data. This shows you what the flux ropes look like. On the right, uh, the current density uh, for, um, at, uh, from the two spots in front of the cathode. Current is about five amps per square centimeter carried by electrons. The blue are magnetic field lines. So this is all measured. So the field lines are derived from the measured magnetic field. I just colored them blue and uh, red <coughs> to so make it easier to see. You, if you stare at this, you could see the ropes twist about each other. Uh, about themselves, like if you wrap up a towel, uh, they twist the, around each other from the J cross B force. And then on the left over here is the place where they collide. All right, so this is shown again and again. This is data acquired at 50,000 locations. If you look at the currents, which we get the curl of B to get J, uh, it, it's a little easier to see how the ropes kink. So I'm going to show you. Uh, these currents versus time. Now notice if the up-down direction is about 20 centimeters, 25 centimeters. But if you go from right to left, we're going out in this picture to seven meters nearly. Okay, so this thing's highly compressed. So these are the rope currents as a function of time. You can see them twisting up on the right. 
<clears throat> then the plasma kinks, uh, the ropes collide, the currents uh, stretch out and unravel. And in fact, this happens again and again, this exact same thing for every oscillation you saw in the B field. So what we did was we made uh, the ropes kink unstable. I think that's the next slide. Uh, if you have two ropes, there is a threshold current uh, called the kink current, and if that current, which depends on the magnetic field, the length of the rope, R is the radius of one of the ropes. And so if you exceed this kink current, which we do uh, by a factor of three, then the ropes are kink unstable. Now if we go, we can go way higher than this. If you go to very large currents, the ropes are kink unstable, but they become so chaotic and horrible that you really can't measure anything. So we adjusted them so that the collisions between the ropes would occurred again and again and again and again, and each collision was more or less the same. The ropes have a dispersion relation, which is derived by uh, Rutoff, and uh, this dispersion relation, if you calculate the frequency, uh, predicted frequency of our ropes, uh, it's something between five and eight kilohertz, and uh, the experimentally observed frequency of the ropes, and you'll see that everything is oscillating at about five kilohertz. So uh, this is a magnetic field. This is all data, uh, but only the perpendicular magnetic field at one plane very, very close to where the ropes are born, so you can clearly see them. And <clears throat> what happens is when they kink, the two ropes smash into each other, and I just drew two little arrows in um, to show you that when those two uh, ropes collide, you have magnetic fields in opposite direction being forced together, and that's when you get reconnection. This is, uh, since we can follow the field lines, we can also follow them in space and in time, so we can just look at two field lines and their separation as a function of distance going away. So when you're really close to where the ropes are born on the bottom, um, they're not uh, moving very much. The further away you get, th these are all offset for clarity, the ropes eventually start moving so much back and forth across the magnetic field that they smash into each other. Okay? Uh, you can talk about something called a squashing factor. That is, uh, if um, you have reconnection and you follow two field lines. There's no reconnection. The field lines will go like this and that. The separation between them will more or less be the same. But if they do reconnect, there'll be a point at which they suddenly may jump apart. So the field lines will rapidly diverge, and this Q is a measure of that. So Q, that Q there, uh, can, the smallest value you can get is, is 4. So if Q is much, much le uh, greater than that, then uh, one suspects there's reconnection. So this is uh, data, again, um, this is a, about nine meters from the top to the bottom, but only 25 centimeters across. This is the current at one instant of time, those candy stripe things to guide your eye, and that blue magenta curve is the quasi separatrix layer, Q100. So this is really large, you, uh, so you know the field lines are diverging, and the, that quasi-separate layer itself is a flux uh, surface, it, so it's B times A and it doesn't change, and what I've drawn in it, and it's hard to see because the lighting is pretty bad in here, but the field lines, if you, which are colored gray, uh, get further and further apart as you go from the bottom to the top of the picture. This is what this looks like if you're viewing this quasi separate Same picture, just looking at it at different angles. So this quasi separate layer isn't just a flat uh, surface, but it's a, a twisted warp thing. And you can see the field lines get further and further apart as you go up. The reconnection rate, this is the definition of it, is uh, essentially it's an induced voltage from Faraday's law. When you annihilate B field, you get an electric field, and then E dot DL is the electric field integrated along a field line. I'll tell you in a minute how we get the electric field, but if you do this integration along field lines, uh, you can get the reconnection rate. So that's shown on the left there, and the reconnection rate is uh, five volts. 
uh, and you could see just in the center that bright line where you have a large reconnection rate, and then shown on the right, it's just completely superimposed uh, on the, on a, this is a plane of the log of Q, the QSL, so uh, 10 to the fifth is really big, and uh, that, that the two uh, are identical, the geometries of these two things. So, Ohm's law. Uh, for a long time, I wanted, I've been interested in what the plasma resistivity is. Is the plasma resistivity um, not classical, and why, if it isn't? And so, uh, I thought the best way to do this is use uh, Ohm's law. This is the MHD Ohm's law. So we have to measure all the terms in this, except for the resistivity, which we don't know. And uh, so it turns out that the turn on the left-hand side, the JDT m over n e squared, if you put the numbers in, that term is so small, you don't have to worry about it. It's orders of magnitude smaller than everybody else. But all the other terms have to be measured. You can't neglect any of them. So uh, this is how we measure it. We measure the elect uh, electron temperature everywhere. And this is, uh, this is three meters away from the, where the ropes are born. So z equals zero is where the ropes are born. This is at a certain time later. And uh, these are contours of electron temperature. So it goes up to 12 eV in the middle of the ropes. The background plasma from the barium oxide cathode is, has about a 4 eV temperature. It's much cooler. That's the blue over there. And the density, at, <clears throat> which uh, they, it goes to 3 times 10 to the 12th in the middle of the ropes. And it uh, turns out that the temperature and the density are uh, contours of constant current look exactly the same, right? Uh, which makes sense, because the current in the rope is large, the temperature is going to be higher, uh, the rope's ionized, so the ropes are fully ionized. The background plasma is about 50% ionized. And so if you have, uh, we need uh, NKT, that's one of the terms in Ohm's law. So um, the ion temperature is very low, about 1 eV, and so this is essentially the pressure NKT. So in the bottom is where the ropes are born. Uh, this goes out to eight meters in this diagram. And uh, these are contours of constant pressure. You could see the pressure is higher, uh, closer to where the ropes are born, and um, gets smaller as you go away. Uh, the ropes actually eventually overlap and mix with each other and very, very far away, uh, the plasma is cooler. So you have a pressure gradient along and across the magnetic field. This is the three-dimensional flow, which is ion flow, um, at one instant of time. And you have this very, I just started following a few flow lines. So in magenta, uh, if you follow them all, um, you won't see a thing. But the flow is very, very complicated. Uh, the arrows over there are the, the flow, uh, arrows of flow. And you could see, if you just look at the arrows, they're tiny on the right, and they get bigger and bigger as you go down the machine. And that's because of the pressure gradient. The pressure's higher on the right, so it's pushing the ions away. And so they're uh, picking up ener energy, and uh, they're going faster when you get to the left. But they're actual. Uh, motion is really complicated. The ions actually meander back and forth from rope to rope. So they don't gyrate around the ropes. But if you look at the Mach number, which is what the Mach probe measures, which is the ratio of the velocity to the sound speed, and since, by the way, we know the sound speed at every location, because we know TE, so this is, uh, uh, whenever we calculate M, it's based on the local sound speed, but anyway, you could see that the flow, or the Mach number, oscillates at 5 kilohertz, exactly the rope oscillation frequency. Okay? Uh, this is the electric field, which we measured. It has two terms, grad phi and dA dt. The grad phi we get from um, an emissive probe, which is a hot probe. Plasma is dense, so we had to make a probe out of cerium hexaboride. That's a whole other story. But we could make it hot enough to emit enough to measure the potential. And uh, dA dt, we can calculate the vector potential from the 3D fields and currents. 
So that's a derived quantity. It turns out that the ADT is about one-tenth of grad phi, that, that the potential gradients dominate everything. And these arrows show you they're pointing inward. Uh, the electric field points inward, so the ropes are negatively charged. You might expect that. They have tons of electron current. Uh, and so close by, you can actually see the two ropes in the electric field. And you get further and further away, the ropes get closer together, merge, twist around each other, and you can't see the separation between them. And it's too bright in here, so you can't see what's happening at six meters. This is the J cross B force. So we have the current from the curl of B. The background field dominates, uh, though we can add the rope field into this as well. And so very close to where the rope are born, uh, J cross B points inward, just like the electric field. Further away, uh, it looks like the picture of the electric field. It points inward toward the ropes. Um, but grad P, 1 over any grad P, these are all voltages, uh, points outward. So the grad P in, in, in the perpendicular direction has the opposite sign of uh, J cross B. And in fact, they nearly cancel. So what's left? Uh, oh, I guess I, don't, I didn't show it. When you take all those terms in Ohm's law and add them up, the thing that really dominates everything is grad phi, gradient in the plasma potential, the space charge, the electrostatic field, Biggest thing of all, all right? So next what I did was uh, put it into Ohm's law and calculate it. I did this 10 different ways, and I totally don't have the time to explain, but I'd be happy to uh, speak to anyone who wants to know uh, all the various ways I tried to do it. But I, one way I thought was uh, to calculate the resistivity along field lines. So I integrated E dot DL. This is the total field with all those terms you saw along field lines, divided it by J, E over J is the resistivity, and then divided that by the local Spitzer resistivity. So you get the resistivity of 50 or whatever, uh, means 50 times Spitzer. So here at this particular uh, time, resistivity is all positive and large and seems to be biggest uh, between the ropes and, and on the gradients of the current. But then at another time, the parts of the resistivity go negative, right? So how can that be? Either there's some exotic dynamo, which we've never seen, and, uh, or, or large currents flowing the opposite direction, which we never saw, right? Um, or uh, there's something wrong with our measurement, but we checked and double checked for a year right, before doing this. So I began to think, maybe we can't use Ohm's law, OK? So in, uh, instead, we found this paper by Jacobson and Moses, who talked about Ohm's, Ohm's law has the possibility of being non-local. Essentially, that means when this is non-local, you either have to derive a no, new form of Ohm's law, but you can't use the one I just used, verboten, all right? So uh, that's the criteria. If alpha is greater than 1, it's non-local. Uh, that means that you're getting contributions to the local resistivity from large distances away in the plasma as these field lines flap around. So uh, we have all the terms in that equation. So uh, we calculate alpha. And this is the calculation. To guide your eye, these are the two ropes, red and blue. And then these are surfaces of constant alpha. So the red surface in the middle there is 12. That's bigger than 1. Uh, there's a surface, alpha is 3. Another one, alpha is equal 8. Three nested surfaces. If you uh, average it over the entire volume, it's 1 and a half. So Jacobson's uh, law um, seems to hold true. Alpha is greater than 1. You have to give up, and you can't use Ohm's law. So what do you do? All right. Well, I uh, found the paper uh, uh, saying that you can calculate from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It's a famous paper by Kubo, 1966. Uh, using velocity correlations, you can calculate a conductivity, AC conductivity. 
But to us, that's perfect because the flux ropes are oscillating at five kilohertz. So all we have to do is uh, omega there corresponds to five kilohertz, okay? And we can calculate these terms, um, and I can show you later if you're interested how I did it, but it's a correlation in velocity at two different positions, um, and uh, we use V from the current. This is how we got the velocity. That essentially, we took the current and divided it by the local density times the charge and used that in that expression. And then uh, for the Z component of the resistivity, I just took, this is a tensor, right? Because nu and mu go from one to three. So uh, the, the resistivity along the field is one over sigma. Uh, just to show you, these are all the components of that conductivity tensor. But the dominant one is the sigma 2, 2. And if you take the one over the sigma 2, 2, uh, this is not time dependent. Remember, it's five kilohertz, but we can see what it looks like in space. This is what it looks like in space. This is three meters away from the birth of the rope. So as you move away, all these uh, components change. But you can then uh, get the resistivity. And these are uh, three surfaces of constant resistivity. And that quasi-separatrix layer where reconnections going on is drawn in. And so first of all, you see, it turns out that on the right and left, you see these big mountains of high resistivity, 20 or 14 times the Spitzer value. And in the middle, same thing. The middle re spike in resistivity we associate with the reconnection, because it's right on top of the quasi-separatrix layer. The other anomalous resistivity regions are just where the currents are. There's three regions. The resistivity is anomalous in the currents, uh, and this is just shown in contour maps. Uh, at, it can be up to 38, 40 times Spitzer, in, uh, right in the middle of the quasi-separatrix layer. Um, and then uh, you could see the currents on top and bottom. Eventually, the, re the uh, Reconnection re layer fades out because the reconnection is only really happening at around four meters away, three to four meters away. And eventually, all that's left is the resist higher resistivity due to the currents. So from the magnetic helicity, here's an expression for relative helicity. Um, this was just published. Uh, you can calculate the dissipation and transport. All right. And actually, the expression we use is a little different than this. Uh, we included flow, density, temperature, and electrostatic field. And what we found is, uh, if you use this expression, the arrows are the transport of helicity into the quasi-separatrix layer. See, the Q equals 100 is one of the contours of Q. And the arrows are going in. And then the dissipation is shown as, in color. And you could see that. Inside the quasi-separatrix layer uh, is where all the dissipation's happening. And if you plot the dissipation and helicity flux into the quasi-separatrix layer, they balance perfectly, right? From this, uh, we predicted, and then looked in an, at the magnetic fields themselves, that uh, only 0.1 gauss of the magnetic field is destroyed. The flux rope have magnetic fields of up to 30 gauss. So a small fraction is destroyed, but that was enough to raise the electron temperature by 1 eV in the quasi-separatrix layer. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to read this out, but it turns out that when the ropes are colliding from this helicity uh, measurement, um, then all of, uh, all of uh, the helicity um, goes into raising the temperature, as I just mentioned. That when the ropes move apart, there's also a change in helicity. And it turns out all of that goes into augmenting the flows around the rope. So I'm going to talk about this, which is uh, the other side of the coin, complexity. All right? Uh, one of the speakers mentioned the permutation entropy yesterday. Uh, I don't think he's here. but. Uh, you can, you can calculate the entropy of a time series, and there's, there's an enormous number of papers on this. And how do, entropy is a measure of disorder, 
And so uh, how do you do that? You take the time series and break it into bins. So there could be typically five, seven, ten numbers in a bin. So, for example, suppose you had a bin with five numbers. What you do is just count of those five uh, data points, which is the biggest, which is the next biggest, which is the next biggest, right? And you get an ordering. So for these five points, I randomly chose point one is the largest, point two is the next to the largest, point uh, five is the third largest, and so on. Um, but since there are five bins, there's five factorial uh, possible combinations. So then you go through the entire data stream and you ask, how many times does this P1, P2, P5, P4 happen? All right? So it turns out just for this one example, it happens 30 times. There are 1,000 data points. Uh, so that's a probability, 30 over 1,000. And it's 1,000 minus the 5. Uh, and this goes into this quantity called permutation entropy, right? So it's a measure of disorder. There's another thing called the Jensen-Shannon complexity, which you may or may not have heard of. I never heard of it until a couple of years ago when one of my colleagues discovered it. Uh, the complexity is, a func is this complicated function of uh, the entropy, S of P, which we just talked about, PE is a maximum entropy state. It turns out that maximum entropy states are no-brainer to calculate. If you have 1,000 uh, numbers, then if uh, every single data value is 1 over 1,000, then, then that's maximum entropy, total disorder. And this is a combination of them. When you do this, you get something called a complexity entropy diagram. You say, what the hell is this good for? Well, uh, the entropy, by the way, is normalized from 0 to 1. The complexity uh, is always less than 1. But it turns out that uh, it was proven by, by these mathematical people in statistics. There are two curves called the minimum and maximum complexity curve. And anything, any, anything at all has to lie between these two curves. Your data will never be outside them. And so I just show a few things. You could take all these maps, logistic map, Hennen map, any of them. They'll be uh, somewhere in there. A sine wave is a point all the way on the left. Um, white noise, if you just put in random numbers, random numbers have very high entropy, but th no complexity. So they're all the way on the right of that thing. Uh, but it turns out that on the top of the arch, oh, and FB is fractional baryon motion. Okay, so um, on the t toward the top of the curve, uh, if you have data there, that means uh, that you, it's very chaotic because the complexity is high. So very chaotic stuff means complexity very high and entropy sort of in the middle of the road, like 0.5, normalized entropy. All right. Also what these guys discovered is that uh, if your data is like the Hennen map or whatever and it's up there, in the region uh, where you have high complexity, the process that led to it being there is not run-of-the-mill random stuff, but it's deterministic chaos. That means somewhere there's a set of equations, which you probably never can find, which lead to this chaotic structure. So a lot of these maps that, you, that, you can, uh, that lead to chaos, you, you put them on this diagram, they're all up there. So what is our, that's the deterministic chaos region. The chaos on the bottom ran, is just random, completely random, non-deterministic stuff like white noise. This is our data. This is a flux rope in the presence of a background alpha and wave. And uh, there we are, highly, highly chaotic, all right? It has this uh, beautiful little hook there. Uh, there's several maps that I drew in, the Hennen logical map, Lorentz 3D map. Um, you can put in anything you like, all right? Uh, but if you're up there where it's red, it's highly chaotic, but the chaotic chaos is deterministic, even though you may not know uh, why, okay? 
And what we did to plot this, there's actually 50, 48, 400,000 dots. Each one of them is a magnetic field versus time. And the thing is, here uh, we did not conditionally average the data. So when you conditionally average it, you get this beautiful um, sine wave kind of thing. All right, I'm just about done. Uh, but we didn't conditionally average it. So essentially what we're seeing is this shows the chaos, but all the field line pictures I showed you before um, show you the recurrent part, the part you can average. This stuff up there, we cannot see, right? Um, this is what this looks like. This develops in space. So these are the minimum and maximum complexity curves. And this is uh, how the complexity um, varies as you move away from the birth of the ropes. The, the rope motion gets more and more complex as they go whipping around. And uh, you get this large uh, hook in the complexity diagram. This is what it looks like in 3D. The last thing I want to say, I know uh, he's pointing at me. Everybody shows the spectrum, OK? Well, here is the spectrum for the, uh, this is um, power spectrum for the flux ropes, magnetic field. It's not, it does not have a power law dependence. It's exponential. In fact, we see exponential spectra in plasmas all the time. They're more common than power law spectra. The, the spikes you see are alpha waves on the right over there and um, the magnetic field. Those are the flux ropes. All those spikes are due to the motion of the ropes on the left. So of course, they, they're not, they don't fall uh, on the exponential spectrum. But um, as, if you take those things out, it's perfectly exponential. Why? Because what, uh, there are, if you look carefully at the magnetic field data, uh, before it's conditionally averaged, there are Lorentzian spikes, right? Structures in the plasma, and you can fit them to Lorentzian function. And once you have Lorentzian functions, um, you get an exponential spectrum. They go together. OK, I'll stop. I'm over. Thank you. Uh, since